are not going to see much emotion from our guy, Brett. This dude is a man David Katz keeps to himself. He's a man of business. He's not here for the experience and to go out, this, that, and the third. He's not here to make friends. He's all business. He's focused. And to even get him to open up to talk to you about anything, it's, it's like pulling teeth, man. At 1.30pm on the 26th of August 2018, 24-year-old David Katz, known in the gaming community as Bread, walked into the Good Look Have Fun Game Bar, a premises located within the Chicago Pizza Store at Jacksonville's Landing in downtown Jacksonville, Florida. He had one intention on his mind, murder. In an incident that would send shockwaves through the gaming community and the wider public, the events that unfolded on that day still puzzle many as a motive was never given. But in this video, we'll take a deep dive into the backstory of David Katz and we'll take a look into some incidents that went down leading up to the 26th of August 2018 that may give some closure on questions that still remain unanswered. Born on the 22nd of December 1993 to parents Richard and Elizabeth Katz, David Katz's early years were thought to have been filled with love and joy. He, along with his older brother Brandon, are thought to have lived well-off lives in Baltimore, Maryland. To no surprise, as Richard had been an engineer for NASA, whilst Elizabeth was employed as a toxicologist for the FDA. There isn't too much information surrounding David's first few years, but we'll assume that the family of four lived out relatively normal lives. The children would attend school, the parents would go to work, and they'd go out for family days when they could. 12 years on, however, that was all due to change. In 2005, Richard and Elizabeth would have a huge fallout over allegations that Elizabeth had been verbally abusive and that she had cheated, so Richard filed for a divorce. The toxic conflict was put on show for neighbours. They had a pretty nasty divorce about 10 years ago, said one, adding police were constantly over here because of it. It was just a very, very dysfunctional family. Between 2003 and 2009, police were called to the family home 26 times. The reasons? Calls out for sex offences, medical emergencies, welfare checks, general police information, domestic incidents, mental illness related issues, civil disputes, child runaways and police assistance. So the couple were going through it and although the split started out as allegations of cheating and abuse, it would eventually turn into a bitter back and forth about how each parent was dealing with the children's mental state. You see, it's thought that when they initially broke up, both Brandon and David developed some sort of mental health issues. The latter, David, would at times curl up into a ball and refused to attend school. So Elizabeth decided it was time to seek out a psychiatrist. David was prescribed with an antipsychotic drug used to treat schizophrenia. We can assume then that whoever was seeing David initially had gave him this diagnosis. Reports of David playing video games obsessively as a young adolescent, often staying up till 3 or 4 a.m. and refusing to bathe or go to school were just a few points that were noted to help give this diagnosis. His hair would go unwashed for days and when Elizabeth took his video games off him, he would be spotted walking around the house in circles. Sometimes it would turn violent. On one occasion, she put the controllers in her bedroom behind a locked door. David proceeded to punch a hole through the door in order to retrieve them. Richard, on the other hand, refused to believe his son had schizophrenia, alleging that Elizabeth was feeding lies to mental health workers and was giving the children medicine that posed a significant risk to them. Richard countered, he seems well aware of reality at all times. Elizabeth provides no evidence showing that either child is suffering from schizophrenia. Although therapists had described David at this time as experiencing a psychiatric crisis. Over the span of David's childhood, he would be committed to mental hospitals on six different occasions and spent 97 days at a facility in Utah. On that occasion, Elizabeth claimed David was in a desperate state and on the verge of a potential schizophrenic break. Away from his mother's influence, David was officially diagnosed in Utah with dysthymia, a chronic low-grade depression and and oppositional disorder not otherwise specified. Although David had some sort of mental health issue, it seems as if schizophrenia might not have been one of them. 
In 2007, the divorce was finally settled and Elizabeth would have custody of the children, although David was allowed to visit, hence why police were called to the address so many times. But that changed when David turned 18. He wanted out. In a letter to the judge presiding over the case, he expressed hatred for his mother and begged the judge to live with his father. I hate her more than anything in this world. I hate everything about her. She's hit me before and always takes my stuff away. I never have enough food at my mum's, but I have plenty to eat at my dad's. The following hearings would lead to David being in his father's custody. So David finally got what he wanted. He was out of his mother's home. Finally, he could stop going to the constant medical related meetings. He absolutely hated those and certain drugs he didn't necessarily want to take. He didn't have to anymore. Life was great. But multiple trips to different mental health facilities over the years meant that David never really settled down at any point during his time at school. For the most part, anyway. In the last couple of years, during his time at school, he was described as being quiet and, as one student put it, a bit of a weirdo. It's unclear if David had a friend group, but we do know of at least one friend who spoke about him on record, Zachary Kosher. Speaking of David, he said he would give off an aura of depression, but we enjoyed each other's company. Our conversations mainly consisted of video games and how David had aspirations of one day becoming a professional gamer. He loved gaming. And that's what he would eventually pursue as a career moving forward. Details are hazy for the next few years, but what we do know is that David grew ever more passionate about one game in particular, EA Sports' Madden NFL, an American football video game named after Pro Football Hall of Fame coach and commentator John Madden. According to one local gamer, David would sometimes attend a weekly game night in relation to Madden events at a sports bar near M&T Bank Stadium. But at that point, gaming wasn't bringing in any significant money, and it wouldn't be too hard to think that his father, a NASA engineer, wanted his son to go out there and do something with himself. He was going to be the one responsible for pushing his son in the right direction, and if anything, it would be a point scored over Elizabeth. Eventually, David attended the University of Maryland in 2014, three years after graduating. He majored in environmental science and technology, but it isn't thought that he graduated. We can't say for certain how long he attended the university, but from sources we can assume that he was still attending there as of the 2017-2018 school year. However, it's thought he didn't register for the spring semester of 2018. On the 19th of October 1972, students at Stanford University competed against one another on the game Space War, a space combat video game developed 10 years earlier. It involves two spaceships called the Needle and the Wedge, each controlled by a player. The aim of the game is to shoot at one another in a dogfight. On that autumn day, Bruce Baumgart won the tournament and he'd walk away with a year's subscription for Rolling Stone. But in reality, he made the biggest achievement of them all. He'd won the first esports competition, and the tournament would be the blueprint for a multi billion dollar industry moving forward. In the 21st century, esports looks a little something like this. We've come leaps and bounds since that first esports competition in the 70s. Look at where we are now. Young people can sit at home and become some of the richest human beings on this planet just by switching on a PC or a console. Even if you're not one of the elite, you can still make a name for yourself within the scene and make some decent money in the process. Madden has been a fan favourite when it comes to esports. Although competitions don't rank amongst the top 10 most viewed esports events, there's still a cult following and a huge cash prize for winners to take home. I'm not going to break down in detail how Madden tournaments work, but to try and simplify, there are various stages you have to compete at which take you to an eventual final event. Some of those stages before the final also have cash prizes. After building a name for himself online throughout 2015 and 2016 under the alias Sliced bread, it was time for David to finally enter a Madden tournament and in 2016 he did exactly that for Madden 17. David would get through some initial stages and at one of the bigger televised events he would even go on to win. 
The Buffalo Bills recently crowned their first ever Madden Club Series champion when eight finalists competed for a $10,000 prize pool in a live broadcast event here at 716 Food and Sport. The competition is really unbelievable because these guys it's an investment for them. I mean, they've had to work and qualify to get to an event like this. There's only eight guys that made it here. So it's a commitment. There's no question about it. It's a way to help grow the game, to grow the fan base, not just for us, but for the NFL as well. We work so closely together, and it just made sense. I think it's pretty cool. Like, the environment's nice. I like this place. I've never been here before either. It's a good choice. It's hard to beat 716 because it's so comfortable. Live action and, you know, you got the huge screen. People waiting on you. You, know, you get food and drink and relax and, and watch these guys compete. You can actually get to see the guys playing. It looks great. I'm kind of shocked with it being a projector that it's that high def. Yeah, it's impressive. It's been really entertaining to see them. Like, I play Madden just for fun. And they're a lot better than I am doing things that I've never seen before, so it's pretty cool to watch. They're highly expert. It's interesting to hear their vocabulary and their depth of knowledge about what makes the game tick. So it does have its own appeal, no question. At the end of this season, we'll have a tournament of champions. The winner from each club event, they'll go into a final tournament. It's 50000 for the winner. No! That last game, the last few minutes, was it was just one of the craziest games I've played, really nerve-wracking. I did think that I probably lost it when I didn't get that fourth down, but I was able to get a stop and got a lucky play at the end. Oh, my goodness, the young man from Columbia, Maryland, the last play of the game, and he gets it done. The goal at the beginning of the year was to get to the final tournament and one step closer. I think the, the industry is going to grow by leaps and bounds. Uh, you're going to see more and more events around the country, and they're going to get more and more coverage. We want to help establish the players to build their persona, to help them market themselves so that they can help us grow the sport. If somebody can make a buck off of it and, and it's got that much interest, there's no question it's a growing sport. Although David walked home with $10,000, it doesn't look as if he made it to the big final event, as his name isn't listed. At tournaments, he would be in his element, but was described as an introvert and socially awkward. He didn't interact with his fellow gamers in what could only be described as a normal way. Despite this, he was successful, and compared to the vast majority of people, he was one of a select few to be classed as an elite player. Although he was among the most elite, if you take a look at the bigger stages in the respect tournaments, when playing he ranked lower than others. This meant then, according to some, that David had became an easy target for bullies. Some reports suggest that name calling was made towards him. Had he been a slightly better player and had a more of an outgoing personality, this could have been brushed off as trash talking, but apparently it got under his skin. Remember though, that is all just alleged. In a court document from late 2019, one alleged incident went down at a Madden event in Las Vegas. It was said that David had attempted to get in a taxi with fellow player Eli Clayton, aka True Boy, but Eli felt uncomfortable sharing a cab, so David was declined entry. It was said that David was visibly upset and would even go on to threaten Eli. In turn, he would report the matter to EA, but it seems as if nothing ever came from it. Located in downtown Jacksonville sits The Landing, a once thriving and popular shopping, dining and tourist destination. But from 2012 onwards, The Landing would start to gain a bad reputation after a few incidents went down, which resulted in people losing their lives. In August of 2012, multiple fights had broke out at a country music event being held at The Landing. The fight would lead to 22-year-old Evans Taylor being run over and killed, but the eventual murder charges were dropped against 20 six year old Greg Johnson. Two months on, another deadly incident took place involving two football fans. Father of three, Chris Petrie, had travelled to Jacksonville from Chicago to watch the Bears play the Jaguars, but he'd never make it to the game. Chris would strike up a conversation with the wife of Matthew Hinson at a bar located within the landing. Matthew, in a jealous rage, walked up to him, pulled a knife from his pocket, slashed Chris's throat and walked off from the scene. Chris would die on the spot and after pleading guilty to second degree murder, Matthew was handed a life sentence. 
The two incidents in quick succession tainted the once thriving venue, and although reputation was on the mend, only five years later, another deadly incident occurred. In January of 2017, two teenage boys aged 13 and 16 were shot in an alleyway located within the landing. 16-year-old Kamoi Peterson would die as the result of the shooting, whilst the 13-year-old would survive. 18-year-old Tyreek Solomon was eventually sentenced to two years probation as part of a deal with prosecutors. He avoided jail after pleading guilty to a felony count of carrying a concealed weapon. He beat the murder charge on the grounds of self-defence. So as you can see from just these three incidents alone, the landing had gained a reputation for violence. Despite this, it was chosen by EA to host a regional qualifier of Madden 19. A specific location would be that of the Good Luck Have Fun game bar at the back of Chicago Pizza. The small cramped space wouldn't look like your regular esports tournament venue. According to reports, officials noted that the space was improper and undersized for such a tournament people were genuinely confused as to how the space was chosen. Either way, the competition proceeded, everyone had to do what they had to do, and so the early games were underway. Elite players like David, Eli Clayton, aka Trueboy, and Taylor Robertson, aka Spot Me Please, were all in attendance, battling it out with one another in order to win the regional prize money and to move forward in the event. All three would progress through the early stages, and by the time Sunday the 26th of August swung around, the competition was in full effect. At roughly 11.45am, David would be eliminated from the tournament, but initially stuck around. Reports say he eventually left and had been pacing up and down Chicago Pizza, asking people for certain gamers' whereabouts. It isn't clear whether he left the venue to go to his car, where he'd been sleeping the night before, but nearly two hours on, tragedy would strike the gaming event. Good morning, everybody. It is our big story on Fox 4 Morning News at 6. The shooting at a video game competition in Jacksonville now has gamers calling for more security at their tournaments. Well, that shooting killed three people, including the gunman. And we do have some team coverage with uh, multiple crews. They're live in Jacksonville as well as here in southwest Florida. And first, we're going to uh, we're going to get to those reporters in just a couple of minutes. We're covering every aspect of this story, uh, not only in those two locations in, in Florida, but also in Baltimore as well this morning. That's right. Let's go to Camilla Bernal. She is live in Baltimore with the very latest. Gamers here in Jacksonville, Florida, were in a virtual world when all of a sudden a mass shooting became their reality. Some people ducked, others took cover, while others just ran as far as they could to avoid getting hurt. But unfortunately, not everyone was able to escape. We have got to change. We've got to really stop and say to ourselves, there's something wrong. Two people were killed in another mass shooting in Florida. Excuse me, not an easy out. This time at an online gaming tournament in Jacksonville. Participants from all over the country had gathered in a pizza restaurant Sunday afternoon to compete in a Madden NFL tournament at Jacksonville's Landing Complex. That's where police say 24-year-old David Katz, a gamer from Baltimore, Maryland, opened fire. Crowds of people scattered in all directions, trying to get to safety in the populated outdoor marketplace. I just heard sound like gunfire, and the next thing I know, I see some uh, people coming out of Hooters and they were kind of fallen. Almost a dozen others were injured by bullets or while trying to flee. There were nine victims transported by JFRD to area hospitals. Seven of those had gunshot wounds. I'm happy to report that they are all in stable condition at this time. The FBI searched the suspect's home in Baltimore, hoping to find some clues as to why Katz committed this horrible act. This is a, uh, this is a horrible day. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, we have to grieve for individuals that senselessly lost their lives. And just to recap, it is two dead and 11 injured, 11 that were taken to local hospitals and that the sheriff says are in stable condition. Now, area streets here have reopened to the public. Of course, that restaurant remains closed. Sheriff deputies are still in the area and just trying to figure out exactly what happened. Reporting live in Jacksonville, Florida, I'm Camila Bernal. Now back to you. Camila, thank you. And crews at our sister station in Baltimore tell us ATF agents have been searching the family's home of the shooting suspect, David Katz. Let's get right to Chanel Perriman. She is there this morning with what we have just found out about the suspect. 
FBI and ATF agents here in Baltimore are assisting in the investigation and they were seen coming in and out of a townhome in this South Baltimore neighborhood for several hours. According to property records, the townhome they were searching is owned by Richard Katz. Neighbors say he is the father of the gunman 24 year old David Katz. He lives on Harbor Island Walk right off a of key highway, not too far from the inner harbor. Now, neighbors say they didn't know the family too well. The people living right next door say they never saw any red flags and another neighbor saying the father is a really good guy, but they didn't know the gunman and only saw him on occasion. Wow, um, I've seen this guy somewhere. But I didn't really know him personally. I feel sorry to his uh, family and parents. They are pretty quiet. They keep to themselves. Um, I see them coming and going from the house, and we say hi to each other. But other than that, don't know too much about them. At roughly 1.30 p.m., David Katz had armed himself with a 9mm handgun and fired 12 shots within the game bar. A Twitch livestream would pick up the red laser on Eli Clayton's chest as he was playing what he loved, Madden. David let off 12 shots, killing Eli and Taylor whilst injuring 11 others in the process. He then decided to take his own life. In the wake of the shooting, all Madden qualifying tournaments were called off for the foreseeable future. EA donated $1 million to both Eli and Taylor's families. It's thought that Eli wasn't even going to attend this event, but in a last minute decision, he decided to go. By December, qualifiers were back underway, this time with a heavy police presence. Many players dedicated their wins to both victims that year, and ultimately Pavan Lakat, aka Pavan, would be crowned champ. The tragedy rocked the gaming community to its core, especially those Madden players. How could a man in a fit of rage get angry over a game and take the lives of innocent people just trying to make something of themselves? The general consensus is that the motive was exactly that. David had became angered that he had lost and decided to take his anger out on gamers at random. But as I researched this case, key details began to paint a picture that offers a different motive. If David was indeed attending the University of Maryland up until the spring semester, then could in his head this have been all or nothing? If he had lost, then he would take his life and take a few down with him. We can't say for certain if that is the case because there isn't enough information in the public domain surrounding what year he left the university. All they say is that he didn't register for that spring semester. Some attendees said the shooting felt targeted though. Could it have been a revenge plot from the taxi incident that went down in Las Vegas a couple of years prior? Or maybe it was a combination of the pair. Even if that was the case though, and again, officially no motive has been given, that's still not a reason to take an innocent person's life because they didn't want you to get in a taxi with them. I must remind you though that this theory doesn't take into account that Taylor Robertson was also targeted and also 10 other people were shot within the venue. Thanks, I am here with True and Problem. True, you got the win, you're moving on, you are still poised, and you have it all together. How do you feel? Uh, I feel great, I mean, like the monkeys off my back, I finally, you know, show people what I can do. And uh, just still, I got more games to play. Uh, I got a lot to prove still. Yeah, and that move last in the fourth and seven, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, <laughs> I honestly don't know, I mean, I. I honestly, I was going to hit the low ball to the left, but I saw him uh, use a peel off to the middle, and I just hit it right in the crease, and it just worked out. It definitely gave you the win. Let's present the belt to the champ. No, I mean, it, you know, this is the first major, phenomenal first showing, phenomenal tournament. We saw every great aspect of Madden here, offense, defense, etc. Taylor, your defense carried you this time. You fought through a ladder of millions of players. You deserve this belt. Carry this home to your wife and kid as the first ever Madden Classic champion. Yeah. In the middle of your game, when you when you heard something that turned out to be shots, and when you heard that, what went through your mind? Um, I mean, I actually think you can hear hear my voice on there. You know, I asked, "What do you shoot me with?" Um. You know, it's I, my my first reaction. I, I heard the shots and I thought, why is there firecrackers in here? And and then I actually got hit. And you know, I I'd never been shot before, so I, I didn't know what to think. And uh, then I turned around and, and actually, you know, saw the flashes from the gun and 
at that point, it just, it just went into you know, survival mode and, and I just wanted to make sure I was out of there. And did you see the shooter? And if so, did you recognize him? I, I saw his silhouette. Um, I could see his hair, but his face, he was holding the gun up and, and the flashes were kind of covering his face because I mean, he was just letting them rip. Um, and then again, once I saw the flashes, I didn't want to stick around to try to ID him. So I just, I hit the floor and, and tried to find cover wherever I could. Um, I feel like I, w I was a lucky one. You know, there's two guys and you know, I'm never going to get to shake their hand at a tournament again. Um, you know, and I, I'm in a hospital room next to my buddy who's, you know, he's got two bullets in his chest and, and they said they're probably never going to be able to get him out again. And it, he's, he's doing good, but it just, it, it really, it breaks my heart to see guys that I care about as much as I do, you know, hurting and, and to see their families grieving. And it's just, it's, it's really something that I don't want anybody to ever have to deal with.